Hello everybody and thank you for joining me today in this class on the subject of AutoCAD Civil 3D Subassembly Composer. In this class I intend to start at the beginning and explain what assemblies and subassemblies are and what they're made from. Then I'll quickly del delve into what you can do with Civil 3D Subassemblies, followed by Subassembly Composer and how you can adjust existing and create new subassemblies. My name's Ian Robinson. I'm the infrastructure consultant here at Grey Tech based in the UK, but our international delegates will still be able to use all the principles in this class as there's no fundamental difference between the nations when it comes to civil 3D and subassemblies. Grey Tech are the market leading multinational company that provide customers with all the tools, training and consultancy to design, simulate, fabricate and manage construction and manufacture projects. We provide all the necessary tools and knowledge to ensure BIM compliance. Now this presentation is aimed at the Grey Tech design stage of BIM. The BIM process is an excellent one for maintaining standards across your business and throughout the entire supply chain. This presentation is aimed to show you two things. Firstly, that you can use Civil 3D to enforce these standards in corridor modeling. And secondly, to show you how to get the most out of your Civil 3D drawing and do things with corridor models you perhaps thought couldn't be done. So to understand subassemblies, let's go through some terminology first. This is an assembly. It contains all the construction geometry required to build a linear structure. It's not a cross section because it can do lots of different things along the alignment and this is not reflected in the assembly. As construction geometry, you can even remove it from the model space. It won't affect your model at all. This is a subassembly. It is the, an element within an assembly that has configurable properties. For example, how much surface course or binder course or what type of curve you're going to use. With subassemblies, when you select one, you get a whole host of properties you can adjust. Some of them are things are like how wide or how deep, but you often get additional properties that let you change the codes. Codes are the makeup of a subassembly and there are three types point link and shape codes essentially point codes are used to draw the feature lines in your corridor link codes are used to add materials to your corridor these could be solid colors hatches render materials and shape codes are used to create solids and calculate volumes in addition to this link and point codes uh, are used to create your corridor surfaces when you use Subassembly Composer. So, subassemblies that can answer a lot of questions and there's a bucket load installed with the software already. And indeed, if you get the country kit installed, there'll be a whole load of country specific subassemblies as well. So before you even open Subassembly Composer, always check what's in the box first. For example, in this scenario here, in this scenario here, you can see that the grading is interfering with this boundary line for these buildings. Okay, So before I go and make one, is the one in the box that will answer that problem? Can I get one to cut back to that line, for example? Another scenario, sometimes you'll add a subassembly and you just don't see the lines in the corridor model. You don't see the feature lines at all. Um, or when you add them, they've got the wrong line type or line style in there. Um, or you need them to follow the company standards, the BIM standards. Whatever, whatever the scenario, let's have a look at how to adjust um, a uh, sub-assembly to match what you need. And then, of course, there's the scenario where you've had a good look and not a man look, a proper look, uh, and there just isn't a sub-assembly that answers your problem. You're going to have to go and make one. So we'll have a look at that. So to make one, before you do anything, you need to do a little bit of planning. First of all, sketch out your requirements. Capture everything, radii, lengths, think about um, construction, geometry uh, that you might have to use if you were, say, drawing this in AutoCAD. In fact, I often draw mine in AutoCAD anyway um, beforehand. It gives me a, a bit of a heads up on uh, how to draw the geometry. Once you've drawn up what you want write down the parameters now these are the properties 
Think about all the properties you want to see when you select your sub-assembly. What side is it on? Uh, the code options. If it's um, a lane, for example, does it have how many courses does it have? Things like that. Next, think about your targets. Do you need to target anything with your sub-assembly? So um, that could be a surface, so a target surface, or a slope, or indeed a polyline, which is what we'll have in this case. Um, codes. Think about your codes as well. So what styles and output do you want within your BIM model? Do you want to see a feature line at which point? And when you do want to see that feature line, what do you want to call it and what style would you like it? What about creating a surface? Does it want a top code so that you can use the create a surface top codes um, for your corridor surface? What do you want the solid object to be called? Again, in line with your, your BIM strategy. Also consider drop down lists. We call these enumeration lists. Um, think about um, in your properties, drop down lists. So the example I've got up on there is a, a curb, a British curb. Um, this is useful to enforce standards on the users as well. And that could be just codes. It doesn't have to be geometry, it could be codes. And again, you, this could be in line with your BIM strategy so that the users will only use the naming convention that you're going to tell them. So let's have a look at these three scenarios. Let's have a look at what's in the box, adjusting sub-assemblies you've already got, and creating new ones from scratch. Right, so let's have a look at um, adjusting them. And I'll use the example that I showed in the presentation. So here we have a road. And you can see that the earthworks here are interfering with these properties here. Now, we already have a boundary for them properties. There it is. Uh, it's just a, a flat 2D polyline. Oh, it's a 3D polyline. <clears throat> um, it could be a 2D polyline, though. There's no reason uh, why not. Um, and what we need to do is we need to uh, adjust this to make sure that we don't interfere with the... Um, with the houses. So let's have a look at that. I'll just fade out the uh, image in the background to make life a bit easier. So the first place you'll go is into your tool palettes. Now what we've got on here at the moment is a assembly with a one in two slope on it. Okay. So let's have a look in here. And the first place I'll look is the UK design because there may be the answer in there. This is where our country kit is installed. So again, each country has their own. Um, and we've just got one called Earthworks and there isn't any other in there, so it's uh, no use to me. So then we'll go and have a look at what's installed in the standard Civil 3D, not the Country Kit stuff. So um, it's called Daylight, isn't it, in Civil 3D. So this is where all the Earthworks are. And we'll have a look down this list to see if there's one that perhaps will answer our problem. And there it is, Daylight Maximum Width. That sounds like a really good candidate for what we're doing. Um, but before I just go ahead and test it out, we can look at its help file. The help files are really useful. So I'll just have a quick look at its help file. Let's expand that. So in the help file, first thing it does, it gives us an image of what it'll do. So very quickly I can see that actually, yep, yeah, that's the standard slope. And I can set a, a width value, which will give us the um, a, a steeper slope, but it will restrict the width of the earthworks. So that sounds good. Not quite right though, because in our scenario, if I go back to here, you can see that that polyline varies in width. It's not a, a single width, so it's not quite answering the, the problem yet. So we'll, uh, we'll have to keep looking. Now if you scroll down, you'll see the parameters. So these are the properties. What, what properties can I change? And there's the maximum width, so I can change that property. Again, doesn't quite answer it. So then if you scroll down, you'll start to look at targets. And there's our target parameters, and you can target a surface, which makes sense. But you can also target, there we are, maximum width. And I can target an alignment, a survey, a polyline, there we go, that's what I've got, a survey figure or a feature line. So perfect, that's the one we want to use. Okay, a little bit of a cheat, I've already put it on. So I'll just go in to the corridor and we'll just check which one it is. So it's that one and that one, okay? And we'll just go and set the targets. So we'll go to targets. There it is, daylight maximum width. So I can go and set that to a alignment, a 
feature line, a survey figure, or a polyline. I'll pick a polyline in the drawing. Hit OK, hit OK, and we need to do the one after as well. Target, daylight maximum on the left. Select from drawing. Hit OK, hit OK, hit OK, and rebuild the corridor. So we should see it cut back. Perfect. You can see that the contours are now close together. So the big question is, what is the slope? Remember, it was one in two a minute ago. So I'll just do a one point slope on there, turn the snaps off, and it's a one in 1.1. 1 .1. So that allows me to engineer mitigation against that steep slope. Ideal, really. Right, next, <coughs> excuse me, Re um, recoding. So in this example here, <coughs> I've just picked out a section of um, a road um, and you can see that there is no feature lines down the center but if we look at this corridor in the model you can see that it actually does have a barrier running down the center there sorry spin it around a bit slower there we are so we have got this barrier running down the center and it's just simply not showing this is a standard barrier straight out the country kit um, and if we have a look at the assembly you can see there's the barrier on the assembly as well. So we do have the barrier, uh, but it's not showing. So first thing I'm probably going to do is go and have a look at the properties of that barrier. Uh, so I'll just select it and go to properties. Uh, and we can see that it's got the construction depth on it. And it's got a shape code, a link code, a feature line code, and a formation code. So we don't know what they actually are at this stage but they're all called barrier. So let's go and have a look in our corridor properties. And if we went to the codes tab and look at points, remember points draw the feature line um, and see if there's one in there called barrier. There is, there's one in there called barrier. So um, let's have a look at the feature line tab. And there's the barrier one. So the feature line tab are the feature lines that are drawn in this corridor. Uh, and there's the problem, the initial problem. It says no display. So it can easily be fixed. Just go in and tell it just to change that display from no display to crash barrier, say. Okay. And the feature lines will draw now. Um, if barriers didn't appear in, um, in here, then we would have to uh, add it. I mean, it'll always appear in there, but if I edit that and go to point and just see if we've got barrier in there, and the answer is we don't, which is why it wasn't displaying. We did have one called crash barrier. There it is, crash barrier left, crash barrier right. Oh, there it is, sorry, no, it was there. And there it is, in our template, it was set to no display. Uh, we'll have a look at how you add in um, codes into your template as well in a minute, okay? So if I okay that, we should see these lines appear. Right, four lines have appeared, I suspect the inner two are these top two points here, and the outer two are probably these points here. So wouldn't it be more useful if these had different feature line codes on them so that we could see that they were different? Well, the properties isn't helping, is it? Because uh, we've just got feature line codes in there. Uh, so what we will need to do is we'll need to open SubAssembly Composer and have a look at it, and we can adjust it. Okay, here's SubAssembly Composer. Don't worry about all the different panels in here and what they do. Throughout this uh, class, you'll, we'll go through them and you'll see how they all work and what they all do. So there's no need to, to worry at this stage. But the first thing I want to do is open up that SubAssembly. Now, they're not all generally available. You will find on the internet and in the help file, in the, um, um, uh, in the knowledge base that people have published these and Autodesk have in uh, uh, published the, some of the standard ones as well as as PKT files. PKT is, is the file type of a sub-assembly. Um, but if you install with your country kit, certainly in the UK uh, in particular, and I suspect throughout the world, um, they give you all the country kit ones here. So uh, they are installed in your, when you install the country kit, they're installed into program data, Autodesk, Civil 3D, and then the version you're using, so 2019, 2020. ENG is the language code. So if you're using the British English, it'll be ENG. If you're using the American English, it'll be ENU. If you're French, for example, using the French one, it'll be something like FRA, there it is. Italian, Japanese, Korean, etc. So that's just your country code. 
So I'm in ENG, the British English version. They're in imported tools. And then they are in uh, source. There it is, source folder. And there's all the PKT files for the UK country kit. If you've got 2020, we've got additional ones here. Um, you won't have them in 2019. You'll have these ones up here. These are the new ones that have been created for 2020. So we've got one called Concrete Barrier. That's the one we're looking at. So let's open that one up. And there it is. So uh, this flow chart is how we draw. And again, I'll be showing you that in a minute. Uh, and this is a preview of what we're going to draw. Um, and if we just have a look at the codes, you can select them in the preview. So if I pick P9, we can see that it's using the point code, barrier point code. By the way, if I pick in here, it highlights in here. And if I pick in here, it highlights in here. So that's quite useful as well. So P7 and P9 are both using this barrier point code. Well, that's on the input output tab. And basically it's using that point code there which is whatever I write in there. And that was what you saw in the properties, wasn't it? It said feature line code, and then it had the word barrier in there. So let's have a look further down. So we suspected it was that point, wasn't it? P12 and whatever that is, we don't know yet. So if I pick P12, it'll highlight it in here. Yes, it's using exactly the same code, barrier point code. If I pick P11, you'll see it's empty. So it won't draw a feature line when that's empty, but it will draw a feature line if you've got that code set up in here and in that code set up in your template. So this one here, we're not sure what point that is. Um, I think, if I remember right, it was P3. Yes, and look, it's got barrier point code. So why don't we put different codes at the bottom as we do at the top, so we can have different feature line at the bottom uh, as we do at the top. So this is a, a good introduction into using SubAssembly Composer and just simply adjusting what you need. We'll, we'll create one from scratch in a minute, so don't worry yet, we are going deeper into this. So let's do that. Let's create another code down here, which is barrier base, and then we'll put a different feature line on it. So to create another code under there, um, if you want to put it under anything in the, in this line, select the line you want to put it under and then hit create parameter. Give it a new name, and I'm going to call this one barrier point code base. Note I'm not putting any spaces or special characters. Think of it like a database. Um, it's a string, so it's going to be letters and stuff. It's an input, and we will put a default one in there called barrier base. And then in the display name, this is the words that you see in the properties. So if I put barrier base point codes, maybe at the, this one here, I'll change that one just to barrier point codes, actually barrier top, I'll call it, top point codes. So we've got these two in here now. Okay, so all I need to do is copy that, and for P3, change it there, and for P12, change it there. So now, if I save this and import it into Civil 3D, we'll be able to put different point codes at the top, as we have at the bottom. Now, if you are going to save it, always save it with a unique name. So I'm going to call this one Concrete Barrier Detailed Version. Um, I'll go version 4 because I did a practice uh, before. Uh, so it's going to be have a different unique name. So let's do a save as. Okay, and I'll call this one Barrier Detailed version 4 and just note where I'm placing it not you me okay so now we need to import that into civil 3d so let's do that uh, to import you go to the insert tab fairly self-explanatory I think import sub assemblies now before I do that if I have a quick look at the tool palettes um, if I put this in focus the one that I want it to land in so I could put it in in here and it'll just land at the bottom job done um, but actually, um, I would recommend creating your own version of this. So create your own um, um, uh, uh, tool palette, and then you can just place it in there. When I do import sub-assemblies, go to import it. There it is, barrier detailed. Yep, right one. 
Uh, I'll put it on that tool palette and I can choose in here which tool palette to put it in, but you notice the one that's in focus is the one that it goes into. And there it is. So let's go in and change this one. So I'll just delete that one. Oh, didn't want to do that, did I? Let me just fix that. There we go. Uh, I just needed a property changing on it. Let's cancel that. And just add in our barrier. Okay. Uh, oh, I forgot to show you the properties. So if we just have a quick look at the properties. So there we are. Barrier top point code, barrier base point codes. And they've now got two, two point codes in there. Now what will happen now when I rebuild my corridor? Something will happen. So the barrier top codes shouldn't change. They should be exactly the same. But the base ones have changed colour. And that's because we don't have barrier base in our code set. So it'll appear in here now because it exists. But can you see it's empty? And in our feature line, what will happen for barrier base? There it is. It will put it on usually the default. So there must be a setting in 2020 that says um, uh, the default will be uh, edge of carriageway. Um, to fix it just in this one here, all I have to do is change that. So I'll change it from edge of carriageway. Um, we've got crash barrier, but that'll be the same. So let's create a new one, a new feature line, copy current selection. And we'll call it crash barriers base. Made by me. And in the display tab, let's put it on a different layer. Uh, okay, so let's put it on that layer there. I'll just copy that. Uh, copy. Yeah, 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 I know. And paste. There we are. So I'll just put it on a, a feature line code. And we'll change the colour. Oh, okay. Crash barriers base. And we'll change the colour. Let's make it kind of that colour. Uh, dashed line like, yeah, okay, we'll go with that. Okay, so it's on a, a different style. Hit OK, hit OK, hit OK. And we should see it change colour. Uh, next, I will uh, just have a look. If you wanted to add it into this code set, because when I create another corridor, obviously it won't know that code, so I need to add it into the code sets. So if I create another corridor with that in, within this drawing, and if you want to do this in your template, then obviously it'll be available at all times. We'll need to import it into here. So to do that, just edit the code set style. And you'll see that uh, barrier base just doesn't exist. So you go import codes, select your assembly. And barrier base now appears in here. And then we can choose the style that we want. Okay, so I will choose crash barrier base. Hit OK, hit OK. And that will be available um, on every corridor within this model now. Right, let's move on. So, <clears throat> the next lesson is about creating a sub-assembly uh, from scratch. So, I've drawn one out here, a um, uh, simple bus stop curb. Um, and some of you may be aware, but some of you may not be aware, we don't even have to use sub-assembly composer to create sub-assemblies. They can be done straight from polylines, which is quite handy. So I'll give you a, a quick overview of that. If I go to the Home tab and Create Design, you'll see Create Subassembly from Polyline. So I've just got a simple 2D polyline here. Create Subassembly from Polyline. I'm going to select the polyline that I want to create it from. It'll ask me for a name. I'll call this one Bus Stop Curb. I'll call this one... Um, PL for polyline, so it'll differentiate between the uh, uh, the other one because uh, we're, we're going to create it with subassembly composer as well. Use the code set, so sensible code set assembly creation. Uh, if you're going to have radii on there, drop that mid ordinate down to maybe a mil, something like that. Uh, link creation, you can do multiple links or single links. 
So if I did single link, it will make this whole thing one link, um, which for coding is not very good, is it? So we'll do a multiple one. And then you can choose to erase the existing element or not. I'm not going to erase the existing element in this case, purely because I want to um, keep an eye on this, look at this later on for doing the uh, subassembly composer. So I'll have it as a reference. So I'll just hit OK. And it creates a subassembly um, on there. I'm just going to move it out of the way. So subassembly. Just move it out of the way, like so. Okay, so let's select our subassembly. And what you need to do now is you need to add all the um, uh, all the codes. Now, I would suggest you add the point and link codes before you add the shape. Um, it just makes it easier to to pick them. So to add codes, you just go add code, and um, let me just do it again. Add code. Give the code a name. So if I say back of curve and select that circle at the back of the curve, I get a back of curve lit, uh, code, back of curve code, and you'll see it's put the label on it because in my um, country kit in the code sets we have a label defined for back of curve already, so it automatically uh, understands that. So then go around coding all the ones you want to see the feature line. Maybe top of curve would be the next one and maybe front of curve. So I would just code them. For coding um, line work, you have to code each line individually. It's a bit of a pain. Add code. So if I do uh, a code here, which is bus stop curve, and pick the link, that has now got the code bus stop curve. So I can put a material on there. So you carry on doing all of that. Um, I'm going to have to do, for timing, I'm going to have to do a here's one I did earlier, so I'm not going to do all of them. Um, to add a shape, you just pick all the links that refer to the shape. Okay, you can just pick them all in the crossing window, oh, if I can get it right, like so, and it adds a shape in, and then add the shape code afterwards. Okay, so we'll add the shape code, call it the same thing bus stop curve and pick the shape okay so you would go and add all the codes in there next the origin will be wherever I started drawing the polyline which is down here so I'll just modify the origin and then we can place that in a sensible place like so and then all that's it that, that's the, the the curve created so where is it landed in here if you go into assemblies, it goes into unassigned assemblies. There it is, bus stop curve PL. Um, uh, I bet often you wonder why we had that. Um, it's for any assembly that's not attached to um, an actual, uh, any sub-assembly not attached to an assembly. So let's delete that curve. Oh, I've obviously uh, had both selected at the same time, which is not good. So let's... Um, Attach that to an assembly, add to assembly, put it on the lane, and let's just move these to the back of curve. And because the bus stop curve is much deeper, I need to narrow the uh, 1.490, narrow the footpath. So what should happen is we should be able to see the feature line uh, adjust. So that's the back of the HB2. If I rebuild that corridor, we should see that line move back. Now because I've not coded it fully in this example, here's one I did earlier where I did code it fully. And if we were to have a look, I'll, I'll put all the, the, the bus stop in there as well in the corridor. My mouse is uh, wild at the moment. So, oh, there is a fully coded, nice, smooth bus stop curb with that radii on. That's the, the exact curb in there. Okay. Okay, right. Let's start with Subassembly Composer now. So, we're going to um, do the um, same thing, but with Subassembly Composer. Now, the advantage of doing this is you've got a lot more control over a the drawing of it but also the parameters 
uh, as well. So let's go to subassembly composer and just start a new one. So I'll just do a new one from scratch. Okay, and refer back to your planning documentation. So the stuff that I had in the presentation earlier on. Um, and the first thing you're going to do is give it a sensible name. So I'll call this one bus stop curb. And I think again, I'm on version four. You can describe it as well if you want. Uh, you can also attach help files. Help files can be PDFs, they can be HTML, they can be docs, docx, or just text files. Uh, and you can also just attach an image, any any image of PG, um, a PGN, a JPEG, etc., etc. So you can just create yourself a little image and attach that in there. The next thing you would consider is the input output parameters. So these are the stuff that's going to appear in your properties. Uh, side will always be in there um, and if you want to make sure that you have the option to put it on a left or right the default value has to be set to either left or right it really really doesn't matter it just depends on which way you're going to draw um, draw it in here okay so I'll have the preview on right um, and then just start adding your parameters so let's have a look at uh, our options so if we were to look in here Maybe I'd want to be able to switch this point on and off uh, because otherwise it's just going to draw that point code um, on the same as the edge of carriageway line. But of course you might have this as a detached object where you do want it to see a point code. So what we can do here is we can add a parameter in which is saying show, uh, show inside PT code, something like that. Just these names, all this stuff just has to be unique and kind of databasey. So make sure you don't put any special characters in it. So with the show inside point code, you'll see you've got your different types of questions in here. And the one is yes or no. And we'll say yes as the default. So that will be in the properties. We can basically turn on or off uh, that inside point code. So let's add another parameter, which is the inside point code. So we'll go inside pt code and that will be um, a string and we will put the um, the value of bus stop curb and in the display name this is what will appear um, in the in the properties so in the display name I'll put inside point code for the one above we can put show inside point code etc you get the idea okay now the next one is I want to put a type in so I want to be able to put double two bits of geometry in here a standard in uh, a standard bus stop curve and a slimline bus stop curve so what I want in the next one is a drop down list which says standard or it says uh, slimline. So to do that, we use enumeration lists and they're hidden away a little bit under view. You can see define enumeration. So I'm gonna click in here and I will say type and we'll add in the list standard. And we'll add another one, which is slimline. So this type should now appear in this list. So if I do create another parameter, Oh, let me do it underneath that one. Create another parameter. Okay, and we'll say um, type. And you should see type. Don't know what I'm there. Something in there isn't there some sort of special character in there so let me delete it add another one okay um let me have a think yeah of course it is um you can't have um two parameters with the same name i've already put type haven't i in the enumeration so define enumeration type okay so in here, we'll have to put something else, okay? So if I put uh, curb type, that's not unique. That's why. 
there we are there's type and in there should be our enumeration standard or slip line okay and in here we can put in type because that's just what is in the display name. You can type whatever you want in there. Description might be useful. So I could put slimline or standard. So that might be useful as well. Okay, so you can put that information uh, in. Then you would consider targets, which we don't have on curbs. So we'll ignore that. Again, we can cover that on a, a different class. Super elevation, if you're working with lanes that need require super elevation and obviously can't for rail. Uh, the event view is quite useful because um, if you see a little red X in there, it means you've done something wrong. And in here, it'll tell you what you've done wrong. I'll give you a clue anyway, at least. Okay. Right. So now we'll work in this main section here. So down there here in the toolbox, these are all uh, the different tools that you can add to the flow chart. And it just works through literally in, in a flow. So you, it does everything in order. Um, so what we'll eventually have is we'll have two branches. So we'll go from start and we'll go... Do we want it to be slimline? And we'll go down one column if it's slimline and another column if it's standard. Um, uh, uh, so what we would be worth doing is defining variables and things like that. But what we tend to do is we put everything in sequences. So you can create a sequence which just groups everything together. So for example, I can create a sequence, call it codes, and in there put all of my link, point and shape codes. So that regardless of which branch I go down, if I change the code at the top, it will change the code in all the branches. Otherwise, you'll have to change each branch individually. Okay, so in the codes, um, let's add a code in, which is define a variable. What I want to do is I want to say if show inside point code is set to yes, then I want to put that as the point code. And if that's set to no, I want the point code to be blank. So we'll have to write a little bit of um, a, a query there. So if I define the variable, and we'll give it an, uh, a name, inside point code. This symbol here means that you haven't finished or you've done something wrong. Obviously, I haven't finished, so I've, I've not done it. Uh, we need to tell it whether, oh, it needs to be a database name. So I'll call it inside, uh, what did I call it, point code. Uh, and the variable type, we need to say whether it's a string or an integer and what have you. It's a string in this case. Uh, and then we'll enter the VB expression. So it's standard VB stuff. So if I type if, and then I need this here. So to make sure I don't put a spelling mistake in, I will paste it in. So if that equals yes, oh, equals, I'll put a minus in equals yes, then standard VB stuff, you put a comma and put what you would like to happen if the, if the if that statement is true. So if that statement is true, I would like to use that code there, i.e. whatever I write in there, comma, and then you put the false statement. So I want it to be empty. Now, anything I put in inverted commas becomes the code. So if it's not in inverted commas, it looks for it in the parameters list. If it's in inverted commas, it just uses that. So if I wrote the word wibble, for example, that would be the code. But if I want it to be blank, I just put inverted commas twice. Okay, it's still showing that symbol. So um, we haven't finished. So if I finish that, if that symbol disappears, I've done it correct. If that symbol doesn't disappear, maybe I make a mistake and miss out the I, it immediately comes back. So I know that I've done a mistake until that disappears, okay? So uh, we have now got a parameter which is uh, going to say if that's on yes, use that code. If it's on no, don't use any code. Perfect. So let's go back to the flow. Okay, so next I want to put in a switch. So basically whatever I say here, show inside point code. If I, I want to be able to go, um, sorry, not uh, curb type. So I want to go um, down one side if it's standard and one side if it's not. So I'll add a switch in. Uh, we can move these arrows. Oh, uh, don't do a loop, just delete them. Make it easier. And put them in. You know how anal we can all get about how neat things are. Okay. So in here, all I have to do is put in this value here. So curb type, and then get, say, give me the value of that. So if I do curb type dot. 
value. There we are. So whatever that says, it will give me a query. Okay, so let's put in a um, uh, another sequence. And we'll put another sequence in. Okay, and I'll just delete that and delete that. And this sequence we will call standard. And this sequence we will call slimline. And then we'll just take it from here into here and from here into here okay and all we need to do is say what the case is okay so this case here is standard so basically if it sees that word go down this route and this case here slimline so if in the properties you set that to slimline it will then go down this route okay so that's what that's for change there we go. like so so in here we will start drawing now so let's just start drawing so you've got all these geometry points here so we'll just start by putting the first point in so that will be uh, this point uh, on here and we'll just start and we'll give that a code which will be inside PT code. Copy. So it'll draw that feature line, providing that's switched on. Okay. And then we'll just draw down from there. So we'll add another point underneath. It lands in the same point, but what we can say is we can go uh, delta X, delta Y from P1. And we want to go down. So that will be um, uh, 15 mil down. So in the Y minus, sorry, 150 mil in it, 150 mil. Hi. So if I click fit to screen, we should see there's a point beneath it there. Cool. And we can also tell it to link them together. So it'll draw a line between them. Let's just carry on. We'll add another point in there and we'll go along the bottom here. Um, and that will be 435 mil. So P3 from P2 in the X 0.435. And add a line. There we are. Okay, let's go up the back now. So we'll add uh, another point in, uh, and it's 314 mil. So from P3, positive in the Y, not 0.314, and add a link. Now, to do the next bit, what I want to be able to do is the um, this arc here. Okay, um, so I can use this construction geometry that I've created. So you can use that, you use auxiliary geometry here. Okay, so if I add a point in that's somewhere over here, so I'll just add an auxiliary point in from point four, and we'll just go back a little bit further, so minus 0.318. I'll add a point in there. Let's add another auxiliary point in. Okay, uh, we'll get this point from a from here. So we'll go from P1, and we'll go in the X, um, 0.105, like so. And then we can just join up that geometry with auxiliary lines. So this is uh, like your construction geometry. So if I join A, P1, and P4, I'll draw the construction geometry. And I can also add in from P1 to A, P2. And then I could also add in from A, P2 AP1. So now I've got some line work that I can put a fillet in, which is quite useful. So let's do that. So we'll put a filleted arc in and we'll tell it to do uh, AL1, AL3. So AL3, AL1, and we already agreed the radius was 0 0.3. No, it wasn't. It was 0 0.03. Was it 30 mil, wasn't it? 0 0.03. Let's add another one in. 
You can copy paste, by the way, guys. Uh, AL2 to AL3. And again, 0.03. Then all I need to do is link them all together. So link, and we'll do P1. The order in which you draw doesn't always matter. So we'll link them two together. Then we'll link P8 to P5. And then we'll link P6 and P4. P6 and P4. Then we can add the shape in. Uh, and to add the shape in, you just go and add in all the links, like so. Now, if I have a quick look at the event viewer, can you see a little red X has appeared? It's saying there's an error. Your shape isn't closed. That's because I've not added all the links in yet. Okay, as soon as I add all the links in, the shape will appear. There it is. And the error disappears. Okay, so always keep an eye on that event viewer. It'll tell you what's going on. Now we just need to add the codes. So um, I would add in the uh, codes. So we've got a code for that one. We could do with a code for P6, couldn't we? So let's find P6. P6. And the uh, point code uh, for that will be top of curve in inverted commas. So it's just going to use that word. Obviously, I could put the coding in the um, in the codes area that we put in earlier, and that would have made life easier. Uh, and for um, P4, which is up here, back of curve. So point code back of Curve. Let me just double check P6 again. Did I put that in the right place? Yeah, point code I did. Yeah. Uh, and then for L8, 4, 7, 6, and whatever that is, L5. So 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay. So for L4, we will give it a code bus stop curb copy um, if you wanted to put one uh, in for top as well you could so you would get um, uh, a surface on it as well um, so that's L4 L5 just paste it in L6, paste it in L7, paste it in, and L8, paste it in. And there we are. Oh, notice an error there. Back of curb. Forgot to put it in inverted commas. Remember, if it's not in inverted commas, it's going to look for it in here. If it's in inverted commas, it's just the words it's going to use. Okay. Uh, so let's do a save. Save as. And uh, we will go into here and we'll call this one bus stop curb version four. Let's save. Let's go into Civil 3D and import it. Insert, import. I haven't bothered putting a picture on it and stuff like that. You know, it's just a, a standard thing. So, a bus stop curb open. My custom sub assemblies. So, there it is. So, we can place that on. Let's have a look at the properties. There it is. Show inside point curb. Standard or slim line. What point code are you going to use? Is it on the right? Is it on the left? All that sort of stuff. So, let's place that one on there. There it is, and then we can move this, move to, etc., etc. So that's how you create your own assemblies uh, using Subassembly Composer, using Civil 3D, um, uh, etc. So hopefully I haven't overrun. I think I might have done slightly. Uh, apologies for that. Um, but I'm sure we've still got some time for some questions and answers.